as people are coming in, let's let's get started. Uh, this is our afternoon workshop for the Socialist Party National Organizing Conference, and this this um, workshop is on Hubert Harrison. And I'll give you a real quick. Um, Jeff is going to speak on this, but I'll give you a real quick run through. Um, okay, Hubert Harrison. Hubert Harrison is a Saint Croix born Harlem based uh, leading black activist, theoretician, and orator in the Socialist Party of America around 1912. And his party experience has much to offer to people today. He subsequently founded the new militant, the, the militant new Negro movement, and was a major radical influence on A. Philip Randolph, Marcus Garvey, and a generation of the quote unquote new Negro activists and quote unquote common people. Overall, he was an outstanding radical internationalist and most class conscious of the race radicals and most race conscious of the class radicals of the day. Um, and I'm also happy to introduce uh, Jeffrey B. Perry, who is an independent working class scholar, formerly educated in Princeton, Harvard, Rutgers, and Columbia. You went to all those schools and you still talk to me, huh? Uh, <laughs> Jeffrey is also a retired postal worker and someone I've met years ago while working in, if you remember this, Jeff, the healthcare, I was at Healthcare Now, New Jersey, and whom I saw this Labor Day weekend at the historic Botto House in Hailden, New Jersey. Jeffrey has spoken a few times in Socialist Party events on Harrison and also on Theodore Allen's books, uh, Invention of the White Race, which he wrote introductions to. Uh, Jeff will discuss his completed Columbia University uh, press publication, Hubert Harrison, The Struggle for Equality, 1918-1927, and his volume follows previously published Hubert Harrison, The Voice of Harlem Radicalism, 1883-1918, to which will also be discussed. And the two volumes compromise the first full-life multi-volume biography of an Afro-Caribbean and only fourth of an Afro-Caribbean after Booker T. Washington, W.E.B. Du Bois, and Langston Hughes. Uh, we will post links to the books uh, on how to purchase these books after the uh, webinar. And as I said, uh, please post your questions um, uh, in the chat, but please wait till towards the end of um, Jeff's presentation so it doesn't get lost uh, in the discussion. And Jeff, it's, it's all you now. Hey, Greg. Thank you very much, Greg. Uh, thanks to the Socialist Party for hosting this. And thanks to all those who are attending and possibly participating in this. I really appreciate it. Um, I, uh, for those of you who have access to the internet, either while we're doing this or afterwards, um, which I assume is most of you, uh, I have a website, which is www dot jeffrey b perry dot net and jeffrey is j-e-f-f-r-e-y b -E perry p-e-r-r-y dot net it's all one word well jeffrey b perry is one word dot net and there is much free information on hubert harrison particularly under reviews at the top of the screen and under sections one, two, three, eight, and nine in the right-hand column. That's if you have a big screen. It's a little different on the uh, handhelds. Section number nine offers some pre-publication information, including blurbs and tables of contents for my 1,000 plus page, <laughs> Hubert Harrison, The Struggle for Equality, 1918 to 1927, the principal book under discussion today. That's the forthcoming book, big book. And uh, at, the, at the top of my webpage, top left, is a very important article, particularly in this period, in, in PDF format, entitled, The Developing Conjuncture and Some Insights from Hubert Harrison and Theodore W. Allen on the Centrality of the Fight Against White Supremacy. Uh, another, just want to get some of this stuff out of the way. Uh, Hubert Harrison, The Struggle for Equality, 1918 to 1927, is the second volume of my two-volume biography on Harrison. It, along with my 600-plus page first volume, Hubert Harrison, The Father of Harlem Radicalism, can be ordered at 20% discount from Columbia University Press by using the coupon code CUP20. Um, I encourage people to order copies of each book 
to consider them for gifts in the holiday season, and very importantly, to speak to your local library librarians as well as college and university librarians to make sure they have or obtain copies of each volume. I actually wrote these two volumes in the hopes and expectations that they would be around for a long time and people would be able to draw on them. They're very meticulously researched. And uh, when I started on Harrison way back, uh, I started way back in 1981, <laughs> um, but I had many things I was doing in between. And But when I came out with uh, volume one around uh, 2008, I cited some Google statistics on Hubert Harrison and the number of sites for Hubert Harrison at that time were between seven and 800, which was staggering low. I mean, for a person of such importance, it's changed considerably now and I have some new numbers. Um, but, um, you know, Harrison is growing in importance and I, I see it, you know, people contact me all the time and he really shouldn't be ignored. I don't think he can be ignored. And both Harrison and Allen, I am convinced are two of the most important thinkers on race and class in the 20th century. They are both Marxists. Uh, they're anti-white supremacist, working class intellectuals. Harrison was in the socialist party um, Allen was in the Communist Party. At certain points, they each left for reasons which I discuss in that article, Developing Conjuncture. And, um, but they brought with them much that they learned, right? And they still have much to share to contemporaries, uh, with contemporaries today. So uh, the way I'd like to proceed is first to uh, offer a uh, brief introduction to volumes one and two of Harrison. Uh, if that's okay. So let me find that. Uh, got it right here. Okay. Forgive me if there's a little repetition from what Greg said, because we didn't really go over this together. But uh, Hubert Harrison, The Struggle for Equality, 1918-1927, follows the Columbia University Press publication of Hubert Harrison, The Voice of Harlem Radicalism, 1883 to 1918. This two volume biography is based on over 38 years of research and extensive use of the Hubert H. Harrison papers and diary, which this author, which I preserved and inventoried prior to placing them with Columbia University's rare book and manuscript library. Much of that material is online now, and this is very important. And in, uh, this is a sidebar for now, but one of the outstanding features of volume two, the book that is really under discussion today, is in my footnoting, I make it a, a, a real uh, priority in the footnotes, wherever possible, to link to material that is online. So for instance, when Hubert Harrison is reviewing a book from 1922, if it's available from the Marxist internet archive or from the Hathi Trust or one of these sites which has some permanence, I link to it and the reader can look at the what he's talking about, you know, and, and check out and come to understand better what he's saying. Um, and very importantly, uh, when I placed Harrison's papers at Columbia, there was an agreement that I would help to digitize a lot of his materials, not all, it's a, a vast collection, but within the past year, uh, they placed online over 1,300 items from Hubert Harrison's papers, including his diary. So this is a gold mine of uh, resources. And in my current volume, I, when, if I'm quoting from Harrison's diary, I'll cite it and you can go to it and read it in his own handwriting, you know? And uh, I think this is a real, in many ways, an innovative way here, pointing the way forward for scholarship in this century, you know, and beyond uh, for making things available to the public, the con what Harrison referred to as the common people. Um, so let me go on, where, where was it? And uh, I, I, this, this biography, my two volume biography is believed to be the first full life multi-volume biography of an Afro-Caribbean and only the fourth of an African-American after those of Booker T. Washington, W.E.B. Du Bois and Langston Hughes. Harrison is a giant of black history and people are coming increasingly to realize that. For many years, he was 
not discussed widely. And uh, uh, Winston James, a historian, refers to his unremembrance. But uh, as I said, this is changing. And now it'll, it'll be the first full length multi-volume of an Afro-Caribbean, only the fourth of an African-American. Harrison was born in St. Croix. He was Harlem based. And um, he lived from eight, April 27, 1883 to December 17, 1927. He was a brilliant race and class conscious writer, orator, editor, educator, book reviewer, political activist, and radical internationalist. As I poured through his papers and his writings and his activities, I was at just overwhelmed at times by how tireless were his efforts and how wide ranging and how deep were his insights. Um, I'll explain what really attracted me to him in, in the beginning in a little bit, but uh, he's just, uh, you know, staggering in what he has to offer. Um, historian Joel A. Rogers in World's Great Men of Color described him as an intellectual giant who was perhaps the foremost Afro-American intellect of his time and one of America's greatest minds. Rogers adds that no one worked more seriously and indefatigably to enlighten his fellow men and none of the African-American, Afro-American, he's using that phrase, African, Afro-American leaders of his time had a saner and more effective program. Labor and civil rights activist, A. Philip Randolph, referring to a period when Harlem was considered an international, quote, Negro Mecca and the, quote, center of radical black thought described him as, quote, the father of Harlem radicalism. Richard B. Moore, an extraordinary activist and bibliophile who worked with the Socialist Party, African Blood Brotherhood, Communist Party, and movements for Caribbean independence and federation, described Harrison as above all his contemporaries in his steady emphasis that a vital aim was the liberation of the oppressed African and other colonial peoples. Harrison played unique signal roles in the largest class radical movement, socialism, and the largest race radical movement, the New Negro slash Garvey movement of his era. He was a major influence on the class radical Randolph, on the race radical Marcus Garvey, and on other militant, quote, New Negroes in the period around World War I. W.A. Domingo, a socialist and the first editor of the Negro World, Garvey's newspaper, explained that Garvey, like the rest of us, Randolph Moore, Grace Campbell, Chandler Owen, Cyril Briggs, and other militant New Negroes, that's in brackets, followed Hubert Harrison. Historian and Garvey expert Robert A. Hill refers to Harrison as the, quote, New Negro ideological mentor. Among considered the most class conscious of the race radicals and the most race conscious of the class radicals um, among African Americans in this in those years, Harrison is a key link in two great trends of the civil rights slash black liberation struggle. The labor and civil rights trend associated with Randolph and Martin Luther King Jr. and the race and nationalist trend associated with Garvey and Malcolm X. And I put in parenthesis, King marched on Washington with Randolph at his side and Malcolm's father was a Garveyite preacher and his mother was a reporter for Garvey's Negro World the newspaper for which Harrison had been principal editor. Harrison maintained that politically, and there's uh, several quotes from Harrison that I might repeat several times because they're, I think, extraordinarily important, but here's one. Harrison maintained that, quote, politically, the Negro is the touchstone of the modern democratic idea. The presence of the Negro puts our democracy to the test and reveals the falsity of it. True democracy and equality implies a revolution startling to even think of. And if I have my prop here, my one prop for the day, this is a touchstone. It's a black stone and you can rub the metal against it to see if it's really the gold that it purports to be. And so it's a wonderful metaphor by Harrison. Uh, it's 
you know, you take democracy, for example, if it's a lily white, quote, democracy, you know, gerrymandered districts, lily white Republican Party, et cetera, et cetera, things that he was dealing with in his day, and we still deal with much, uh, can, uh, we deal with very, very often today. It, if it's a lily white democracy, it's a retardant to social progress. But if it's a genuine and thoroughgoing democracy, it's a catalyst for radical social change. And I think that's just extraordinarily profound. And uh, Harrison, as I said, he, uh, he says it at various times and uh, I will come back. And I had another little thought, but as you get older, you'll perhaps you'll all learn the short-term memory goes. <laughs> so I have more, but we'll come back to it. Um, Harrison also asserted uh, that the uh, mission of the Socialist Party is to free the working class from exploitation. Oh, one thing, yeah, I do want to go back. On this touchstone, the metaphor, um, the, the understanding this twofold nature of uh, democracy, when it's, when it's uh, all lily white, it's regressive, when it's thoroughgoing, it's progressive, for me brought immediately to mind Karl Marx writing to Frederick Engels in 1867 with uh, uh, capital on the table. And um, he, uh, he said the key, key point, one of the key points in, in this book, in, in this volume, I think he's talking about the first volume, is the twofold nature of labor as use value and exchange value. And he, so he, you know, Marx nailed that one, I think. And I think Harrison's getting at a similar concept, similar understanding anyway, with the touchstone. Moving on, uh, Harrison uh, asserted that the mission of the Socialist Party is to free the working class from exploitation and the duty of the party to, quote, champion the Negro's cause is as clear as day. This is the crucial test of socialism's sincerity. I'll come back to this a little later. But when he says this, he precedes Du Bois. A lot of people quote Du Bois on a similar topic, but Harrison precedes Du Bois. Harrison and Du Bois were in the Socialist Party at roughly the same time, although Harrison was writing major pieces and uh, Du Bois was not so involved. Harrison speaking all over. And um, Harrison was continued to campaign during the 1912 uh, presidential election. He campaigned for Debs. Whereas Du Bois, and I discussed this in volume one, Du Bois left the Socialist Party. He had been fed some stories about <laughs> what might happen, you know, if he went in a different direction. And he, um, uh, he left uh, and uh, to support Woodrow Wilson, right? So, and w Wilson, of course, segregated the federal sector, brought Birth of a Nation into the uh, White House for screenings. He, um, went into various countries, Haiti, Dominican Republic, later on Virgin Islands, he's down there. Uh, so, uh, but Harrison didn't fall for that at first, you know, in 1912, uh, but he, you know, very different from Du Bois as far as staying for that. So after um, Socialist Party statements and practices, however, caused Harrison to leave the Socialist Party in 1914. I will get into this. After the departing the Socialist Party, he offered what is arguably the most profound but least heated criticism in the history of the United States left. He said that the Socialist Party leaders, like organized labor leaders, put, quote, the white race first before class. They put the white race first and class after. And he had very specific examples he's citing in his era. Within two years of leaving the Socialist Party in 1914, Harrison turned to concentrated work in the Black community. Beginning in 1916, he served as the intellectual guiding light of the militant New Negro movement, a race-conscious internationalist, mass-based, autonomous, militantly assertive movement for political equality, social justice, civic opportunity and economic power. This Harrison led new Negro movement represented by his newspaper, The Voice 
and his organization, the Liberty League, involved many outstanding activists, viewed itself as consciously breaking from the old time leaders and fertilized the soil for and laid the basis for the growth of the Garvey movement. Again, in volume one, I list all these very important black activists who were involved with the Liberty League. It was also a precursor to later developments, including the black power movement, the anti-war and anti-imperialist movements, and with its calls for enforcement of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments and for federal anti-lynching legislation, which the NAACP did not support at that time. We might get into this talking about that. Uh, it was a precursor to the civil rights movement. Okay, this second volume, just preliminary here, the struggle for equality details the extraordinary last nine and one half years of Harrison's life, uh, which were lived at the edge of poverty in the United States, marked by a great inequality produced by capitalism, imperialism, and white supremacy. Harrison, in that context, was race conscious, class conscious, and a radical internationalist. And he had found that the left and labor movement, as I indicated, put the white race first before class. In that context, he deemed it a priority to oppose white supremacy as a key to radical social change efforts, to struggles for political equality, and to developing an enlightened race consciousness, racial solidarity, and radical internationalism among the Negro people, especially the common people. Volume two is presented in roughly chronicle or chronological order and has four broad sections. Part one, 1918 to 1919, covers his pioneering seminal and long ignored writings and work as a founder and leader of the militant New Negro movement. Most people, when they discuss the concept New Negro, if they're getting their knowledge from the academy, if you will, uh, associate it with Alain Locke, which is a more middle-class literary movement around 1925. But Harrison's New Negro Movement is founded in 1916-17. Uh, he puts out a newspaper called The New Negro in 1919. And his book, uh, uh, his book When Africa Awake, it Awakes in 1920 is subtitled The Inside Story of the Stirrings and Strivings of the New Negro in the Western World. All of this is years before Alain Locke. Uh, part two, section two, if you will, of uh, the second volume details Harrison's outstanding contributions and impact as a writer for and editor of the Negro world. And this is when Marcus Garvey's newspaper sweeps the globe. It also discusses Harrison's important differences with Marcus Garvey, as well as his differences with black so socialists, including those around the emancipator, which is particularly Randolph and Owen. It makes clear that Harrison's writings and literary influences, including book review and poetry for the people columns, contributed significantly to the climate leading up to Alain Locke's publication of The New Negro. So Harrison's, while he's, he edits The New Negro in 1920, and he's a brilliant editor, and but he's writing articles, and they're very political, they're very literary. He initiates book review, poetry for the people, West Indian news notes. He's tireless he, and he does great work. Um, 1922 to 24 focuses, this is after he's kind of separated from Garvey, focuses on his prolific and wide ranging writing and speaking efforts as an independent freelance educator, including work as a public lecturer with the New York City Board of Education and as a regular columnist for the Boston Chronicle. Um, part four examines his more broadly unitary efforts in his last years, including his uh, final organization, the International Colored Unity League, and its organ, the Voice of the Negro. While telling the important story of his life between 1918 and 27, this second volume pays attention to the problems and political issues Harrison confronted, reasons for his previous neglect, and reasons for the new and growing appreciation of him and his work. It draws from his writings, talks, diary, scrapbooks, over 40 of which remain, personal correspondence, and 
many other primary and secondary source materials. In the process, it also provides important insights on the period in which he lived, on prominent contemporaries and other key figures on a wide array of political and literary subjects, as well as struggles that were waged. Harrison's most personally revealing document is his diary, recently made available online. He first started shortly after arriving in the US, but it was not continued and that copy has not been located. When he restarted a new diary on September 18, 1907 at age 24, he wrote down his thoughts on why he made that decision. He wrote, it must surely be instructive to look back after long years on one's past thoughts and deeds and form new estimates of ourselves and others. Seen from another perspective, large things grow small, small ones large, and the lives of relevant, relative importance are bound to change position. At any rate, it must be instructive to compare the impression of the moment, laden as it may be with the bias of feeling and clouded by partisan or personal prejudice with the more broad and impartial review which distance and time or space make possible. This may serve me in some sort as a history of myself, twisted of two threads, what I do and what I think. I hope I shall not make any conscious effort to impress upon it a character of any sort. So far as life is concerned, as it comes, <clears throat> so must it be set down. And if I omit any one phrase of my life's experience, I do so for judi uh, judicial reasons and not for the sake of seeming better in my own eyes when memory has ceased to testify. Thus, while Harrison wrote his diary for himself, there is no doubt from its content and occasional marginal comments that it was also written for those who would come after him to read and learn from. It seems clear that even as a young man, he had a strong sense of self-worth. He was aware of the importance of the work he undertook, and he thought it important that a more complete record of his thinking and actions, as well as the period in which he lived, be recorded. To quote again, as it comes, so must it be, so must it be set down. <clears throat> the biography reinforcing the importance and value of Harrison's approach often cites his diary and papers. In its approach, it also draws insight from a Harrison meditation offered in October 1920 Negro World article entitled A Soul in Search of Itself, where he writes very simply, quote, no man was ever as good as his creed, end quote. In a similar vein, this volume approach uh, this volume's approach draws from comments by two of Harrison's contemporaries, Eugene O'Neill and J.A. Rogers. O'Neill, a future Nobel Prize in literature winning author, in a June, 19, uh, June 9th, 1921 letter to Harrison, excuse me, wrote, the only propaganda that ever strikes home is the truth about the human soul, black or white. Intentional uplift never amounts to a dam, especially as uplift. To portray a human being, that is all that counts. Historian Rogers, one of the most percept uh, perceptive writers of Harrison's life, and a man who knew Harrison and his family well, offered, <coughs> Harrison was not without his faults. The life of any leader scrutinized detail for detail does not look like the handsome image presented by ecstatic admirers after flaws have been removed and bits retouched. As the saying goes, quote, no man is a hero to his valet. In Harrison's case, however, as Rogers emphasize, emphasizes, this was no reason to deny his essential greatness. Finally, uh, this second volume will also keep in mind words uttered at uttered at Harrison's funeral, it was a massive funeral, by the extraordinary bibliophile of the Black experience, Arthur Schomburg, that partly inspired the writing of this biography and have relevance for current and future generations. Schomburg, with great historical perspective and knowing how immensely popular and important Harrison was in his day, simply stated, he came ahead of his time. Now, 
Got a little sip of coffee. And I'm just going to go through, if this is OK, Greg. Volume two has 20 chapters. And I'm just going to go through, I think I have it right here. Let's see if I can find it, bear with me. Uh, I have a brief one paragraph uh, kind of summation on these chapters. So if people just want to hear what he's getting into in each chapter. OK, here we go. Uh, chapter one is entitled Return to Harlem, the Voice, Surveillance, and the Armistice. And this chapter discusses Harrison's return to Harlem from the Washington, D.C. Liberty Congress, the major Black protest effort during World War I that Harrison co-chaired with William Monroe Trotter. He was a Black leader of national prominence, but with a wife and four children, he had no clear source of income. It describes how he resurrects his newspaper, The Voice, the first newspaper of the militant New Negro movement, and how he develops plans to extend its reach from New York to Washington, D.C. and the South. His views on the type of Negro leadership that is needed and on the importance of developing race consciousness and class conscious radicalism in the white supremacist and capitalist U.S. are, are discussed. While undertaking this work, Harris had become the subject of government surveillance and attempts at entrap entrapment. This chapter concludes with some of his thoughts on the armistice and the upcoming peace conferences. Chapter two covers the period from January 19 to July 1919 and focuses on Washington, D.C. and Virginia. This chapter reviews Harrison's public speaking in Washington, D.C. and discusses some of his diary notes from this period. Particular attention is paid to his new covenant of peace in which he lays out the basics, the, the very core ideas that he thinks are necessary to understand. And they revolve around equality of opportunity and equality of voting rights and things like this. He, 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 he believes that if African-Americans are treated equally in these key areas, really equally, they can run with it from there. They can, they can you know, African-Americans can develop what is needed for further efforts at liberation. Um, this chapter reviews Harrison's public speaking in Washington, D.C. and discusses some of his diary notes from this period. But, uh, Major Walter Loving of military intelligence offers an appraisal of the impact of Harrison and other black speakers in DC. These are from some of the government documents. Harrison, as he had planned, extends his outreach to Virginia with public speech, speaking events, but to, to, due to health issues, he has to cut short his tour. Finally, this chapter offers some comments on the case of the Dutch anthropologist, Herman Bernalot Mons, who is connected to Harrison and is believed to be a, si a spy and subject to Bureau of Investigation and mil military intelligence monitoring and entrapment. Volume three, July to December, 1919, discusses Harrison's work as new Negro editor and agitator. This chapter discusses the violent class and race struggles of 1919 and the development of militant new Negro radicalism. The Harrison edited new Negro magazine of August through October, 1919 is discussed in depth. Particular attention is paid to his Negro, uh, his news commentary columns, features, and major articles and editorials. Harrison's internationalism is also discussed as in a draft article that he wrote on the attitude of the, of the American press toward the American Negro. Chapter four, a very important art, uh, chapter, is Reshaping the Negro World, December 1919 to May 1920. This chapter discusses the early years of the Garvey movement, internal and external difficulties and Garvey's quote takeoff after a disgruntled Black Star Line ticket holder attacked him in October, 1919. Then in December, 1919, Garvey asked Harrison to head a Negro college he is planning to work on, he is planning and to work as editor of the Negro world. After discussing some Harrison's social and familial activities this chapter examines how Harrison 
in an important undertaking in the history of black journalism reshapes the Negro world. Discussion then moves to Garvey's selection of Harrison to lead a Liberian commission. Harrison was not a citizen, however, and he could not go. And it concludes with extremely, re extremely revealing Harrison comments on Garvey's character. Ch chapter five, you with me so far? We're getting there. The debate on the emancipated. Emancipator was a publication uh, with socialist editors, uh, Chandler Owen, Domingo A. Philip Randolph, uh, around 1920, March, April, 1920. Harrison views that, uh, and he has a debate in the pages of the Negro world with them in, in, in the messenger. Harrison views that he's defending the basics of the new Negro movement. Among in, important writings in this debate are Harrison's race first versus class first, Chess Crabs, and ensuing pieces in the crab barrel verses. Sometimes Harrison would get literary and poetic in his responses. Uh, also discussed is Harrison's poetry for the people column in the Negro world. Harrison would promote and publicize and publish uh, poets, a lot of unknown poets. And he really took a lead in doing this also. He, understand the, he understood the interrelation of the arts and literature and politics, uh, extraordinary uh, intellectual. Uh, and Harrison's comments and his debate with the emancipator may have been a factor in the emancipator ceasing publication, which I discuss. Chapter six is Harrison's Negro World Writings from January to July, 1920. It pays particular attention to the leadership question amongst uh, Negro, uh, Negro people, domestic issues, internationalism, education, and Negro poets again. Harrison was described as, quote, the first regular book reviewer in Negro newspaperdom. And his book review and our little library sections are examined. He's constantly encouraging readers of the Negro world and others to read, read, read. And he's listing books that he recommends and suggests, and he's reviewing them. Uh, and it also, uh, a particular note in this chapter are his uh, pioneering West Indian news notes column and his correspondence with T. Lothrop Stoddard, author of The Rising Tide of Color, which was attach, uh, attracting major attention because of its projected, uh, its discussion of threats to the survival of the white race, a theme that Harrison had been discussing since 1915. Chapter seven goes from August to November, 1920, the period of the UNIA convention and Harrison's publication of When Africa Wakes and his founding of the Liberty Party. This chapter discusses the 1920 convention of Garvey's UNIA. Eli Garcia's confidential report on Liberia. He had been sent by Garvey to Liberia to report on what were the prospects for the Garvey organization in, in Liberia. It then examines Harrison's detailed appraisal of Garvey in his diary and looks at his convention articles and editorials. It then reviews his August 1920 book, When Africa Wakes, The Inside Story of Stirring and Strivings of the New Negro in the Western World, and his work with the L Liberty Party, as well as his lectures for the Harlem People's Forum and as well as his touring and speaking in Virginia and Philadelphia. After discussing Harrison's leaving the managing editorship of the Negro world, it examines his radical, in, in, in many sections at the end of the chapter, it examines his radical influence on Garvey's Negro world and UNIA and elaborates on reasons for considering Harrison as a major ideological influence on Garvey's radicalism. Chapter eight, Negro World Articles and Editorials and Reviews, September to December, 1920. This chapter opens with Harrison's meditations and an articulation of his creed. It, it's so fascinating when he gets revealing and lays down what he thinks, you know, his personal views on things and he puts them out there. It then examines his writing on the Ku Klux Klan and the lineup on the color line. In his Negro World book reviews in, the late, in late 1920, Harrison reviews books related to the Negro by Robert Moton, Herbert Seligman, Robert Curlin, and books on Africa. These are the books, as I mentioned, which now can be linked to directly uh, from the notes. 
He also received uh, Thorsten Veblen's The Place of Science in Modern Civilization and other essays. And the theater concludes with theater reviews and discussions of Harrison's financial difficulties as 1920 ends, seemingly ever present financial difficulties. Um, chapter nine, we have 20, so we're getting there. Negro World Writings, January to April 1921, focuses on Harrison's Negro, Negro World Writings in early 1921. After discussing some articles and ed editorials, wide ranging book reviews are discussed in depth. Harrison's very important series on Lincoln and Liberty is presented and is followed by Lafayette Theater Reviews. Now, Harrison wrote some profoundly important and insightful essays on Lincoln and liberty, going as far back as 1911 when he's with the Socialist Party, but he starts publishing them uh, more widely in the Negro world in this period. And what's important is these articles, at least I think what's important, is they precede some of the insights uh, that appear later on, half a century or more later, in Lerone, more than half a century later, in Lerone Bennett Jr.'s book um, dealing with these topics, and then even more recently by Eric Foner's work on this, but neither uh, Foner nor Bennett cite Harrison's earlier work. Chapter 10, Political Developments and Negro World Writings. This chapter discusses the developing crisis in the Garvey movement and the attention paid by ha to Harrison by Garveyites radicals and the Bureau of Investigation in 1921. Harrison's Wanted, a colored international is discussed and that's a major article. Um, uh, the Soviet uh, Union is trying to push for uh, you know, in, uh, an international, but Harrison's talking about the need for a colored international. I'll give you some quotes later. Um, uh, you know, the Soviet Union has a, well, it's not the Soviet, Soviet Union, Russia uh, has, uh, is pushing for um, an international and uh, second international, excuse me. And Harrison's talking about the need for a colored international. Is this his, so Harrison's wanted a colored international is discussed as are the Liberty League, and the attack on the Tulsa, Oklahoma, African-American community, which there's been some recent discussion of this year, this past year. Increased Bureau of Investigation surveillance and problems in the Garvin movement provide background for discussing Harrison's Negro world writings and reviews in this period. And special attention is paid to Harrison's review of the play, The Emperor Jones by Eugene O'Neill. This chapter closes with other literary con correspondence with Henry Louis Mencken, T. Lothrop Stoddard, and J.P. Williams. Um, chapter 11, Negro World and Other Writings, October 1921 to April 1922, focuses primarily on Harrison's Negro World writings in late 1921 and 22. Special attention is paid to the topic of democracy in imperialist America, the Washington Peace Conference on Disarmament, and to the article, Disarmament and the Darker Racin Races. Harrison's book and theater reviews are discussed, again, with special attention on, on started, but also on J.A. Rogers. The chapter closes with discussion of Harrison's West Indian news notes and his article, The Black Tide Turns in Politics, and a section on aphorisms and reflections from his diary. Chapter 12, the period of Garvey's arrest discusses events leading to Marcus Garvey's arrest for mail fraud. Uh, and this is the period of Garvey's arrest from September 1921 to March 22. It includes statements and testimony by many black activists, including an important Harrison statement to federal authorities and related memoranda. Also discussed is Harrison's search for work, his teaching at, uh, at a chiropractic college, the 1921 election, the Democratic Party, and Harrison's early Board of Education work. Chapter 13, Looking for Work, Board of Ed work, Democrat, Democrat Citizenship and Single Taxes, discusses Harrison's search for work, uh, lecturing for the New York City Board of Ed. He also discusses the ever-present financial problems, uh, and book reviews are discussed in this period, and his acquiring US citizenship. Attention is also paid to his work with single taxes and Democrats. 
and to a powerful evaluation of his lecturing by William Pickens and to Harrison's review of Carter Woodson's The History of Negro Church. Chapter 14, the KKK writings, the nation, the Virgin Islands, the Board of Education, begins by discussing the rise of the Ku Klux Klan and Harrison's challenge to the KKK in Patterson, New Jersey. In early 1923, uh, the KKK was starting to come into New Jersey now, and they had a Leif Erikson chapter, which burned a cross on Garrett Mountain, that overlooks Patterson. And uh, Harrison went out to Patterson, where he had spoken years earlier with Elizabeth Gurley Flynn and Big Bill Haywood during the Patterson strike. He was the only black speaker during that struggle. And he went out and challenged the KKK to debate. And he had a big turnout. And according to the press coverage, you know, he won the day. But it also discusses his thinking on the control of Negro sentiment, his continuing work for the Board of Education, and his, his social activities, and, and his, uh, his insights on Garvey's trial for mail fraud. Uh, and how Harrison in this period writes a powerful article entitled Marcus Garvey at the Bar of United States Justice. Harrison's reviews, speaking and social activities are then discussed and he pays and in particular attention is paid to a very lengthy article he does on the Virgin Islands, a colonial problem which was submitted to the nation, but not published. Very long article, deep, profound, and uh, still of much interest to activists in the Virgin Islands today. Um, Boston Chronicle, uh, chapter 15 is on the Boston Chronicle. Harrison wrote briefly for the New York Interstate Tatler and continued lecturing for the Board of Education. But then he began a six month series of weekly articles for the Boston uh, Chronicle. The concluding section discusses Alain, of this chapter, it discusses Alain Locke, Paul Kellogg, Survey Graphic, and the special ne New Negro issue. And Harrison submitted article, which was not published by Survey Graphic in its New Negro issue. Uh, it, it has been suggested by other scholars, and I, I certainly take no issue with their position, that it was because it was too radical. Um, chapter 16, International Colored Unity League Midwest Tour, New York Public Library Board of Ed and Amy Ashwood Garvey, March 1924 to December 1925, discusses Harrison's founding of his International Colored Unity League, its program, its proposed establishment of a Negro state or states in the US. It also discusses the relation to the single tax party. Uh, Harrison continued work as a New York City Board of Education lecturer and had some personal interactions with Amy Ashwood Garvey, that's the first wife of Marcus Garvey, and Augusta Savage. Uh, of great historical importance, toward the end of the year, he is an officer of the founding committee of the New York Public Library uh, on 135th Street Negro Collection, which later develops into the world famous Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture. Chapter 17, Board of Education, Virgin Islands, NYU, et cetera, uh, focuses on Harrison's lectures for the Board of Ed, International Colored Union League, Hall of Educational Forum, and series of lectures he delivers at NYU and Columbia. Harrison never did a day, never finished high school, never did a day in college, and he's delivering a series of lectures for the Board of Ed, for the NYU, and for Columbia. It also discusses courses he gave at the Worker School of the Communist Party and for the Institute of Social Study, as well as writings for Opportunity, the magazine of the Urban League, and some more literary uh, pieces and uh, uh, reviews, including on the significance of the play Lulu Bell, and uh, a major piece that he wrote for Modern Quarterly on the real, on the real Negro problem. Three chapters left here. Uh, ch uh, chapter 18, Institute for Social Study, Urban League, uh, American Friends Service Committee, Lafayette Theater, Stratton Garvey's trial, discusses Harrison's work for the Institute for Social Studies, Urban League, American Friends Social, uh, American Friends Service Committee includes Harrison's review of Carl Van Vecken's book, quote, Nigger Heaven, as well as other book reviews. Uh, also discussed are um, 
uh, Harrison's writing of the need for black policemen in New York, as well as the di divorce trial between Marcus Garvey and his face, first wife, Amy Ashwood Garvey, a trial which Harrison was drawn into. Chapter 19, which is January to April uh, 1927, opens by discussing Harrison's reviews, lectures, and social activities, includes coverage of testimonial activities for him. It then discusses Harrison's final two publications, The Embryo, The Voice of the Negro, and The Voice of the Negro, and particular atten attention is paid to the program of the principal, uh, the, the program and principles of the International Colored Unity League. Chapter 20 is his last month and death and includes Harrison's article, World Problems of Race, uh, another article, Holland's Neglected Opportunity, and uh, Pittsburgh Courier articles and uh, discusses Harrison's social activities. He also uh, reviews his talks at the Brooklyn Queens Y, the 135th Street Y, and before the Independent Colored Political Club of New Rochelle and Temple Israel of Far Rockaway. In, his, in addition, his correspondence with J.A. Rogers uh, is examined as is his sudden unexpected death from an appendicitis related condition at Bellevue Hospital in New York on December 17th, 1927. Also discussed is his massive Harlem funeral and burial at Woodlawn Cemetery in the Bronx, paid for by Casper Holstein and the role of his pallbearers, including Richard B. Moore, Charles Seifert, Arthur Schomburg, and Selmo Jackson, and George Young, some of the leading bibliophiles uh, in Harlem. Uh, chapter 21, the epilogue includes uh, condolences, obituaries, and tributes from a host of people, including socialist Frank Crossway, Oscar Benson, Benson Andy Razif, Hodge Kiernan, A. Philip Randolph, William Jones Burroughs. And it discusses meetings uh, that were held uh, at the 135th Street Library in tribute of Harrison. It discusses how Harrison's portrait was gifted to the 135th Street Library and placed in the main lobby, although now at the Schomburg Center, it's not there. And uh, it also discusses a Hubert Harrison Memorial Church, which was established after his death. So that's volume two. <laughs> Greg, you there? Yes, I'm here. <laughs> Too long? No, I think it's fine. I'm, it's, it's uh, uh, let me see if I can get this to gallery view. Um, no, this is great, and thank you so much. Um, I have a couple of little insights for the Socialist Party, but if you want to see if any people... I think that is probably going to be our our first question. I know Bill asked. I know you've you've reviewed this at, um, at presentations during the first volume yes. before, but, um, you know, we don't know our history. We don't know... No. We don't know um, specifically not the, the celebrities or the folks that kind of get buried. And, right. But but sometimes you need to know those folks to, to learn, you know, some of the, the, the biggest lessons. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. Give us give us an idea. Now, this is, you know, at the SPUSA, you know, we came out of that split in 72. And I think the the party moved more social democratic and right wing. And I think we we claim we hope to see ourselves as the left wing version of rebuilding that left as a radical uh, socialist tradition. But um, the Harrison question brings up a lot, especially with a the separation from the um, new African and black communities in the early socialist party. So right. what so, do you have to uh, say on that one? Yeah, I'm going to have a, just a, a few little things. I've, I've got them here in some PowerPoint slides. Hold on. Um, okay. Harrison um, got fired from the post office. He, like me, like Theodore W. Allen, we were all postal workers, right? And uh, he got fired for speaking out against Booker T. Washington, who was the leading black uh, figure in the country at, uh, at that time. And uh, he went to, he, he joined the Socialist Party. He may have been active, he may have been in it earlier, but he becomes active in 1911. Uh, now, background on the Socialist Party in that period is, it was considered the party of, this is the party of Debs, right? It was considered the party of the working class. That's how it built itself. In 1908, it had 40,000 members and 400,000 votes, 3% of the population. By 1912, it went up to 6% of the vote. Its 1908 platform included anti-monopoly and antitrust, 
pro-nationalization of industries, eight-hour workday, graduated income tax, women's suffrage, it's the only major party uh, advocating women's suffrage, and public works program. In the party at that time, and I'm skipping quite a bit, there were two major ideological differences. And it was between those, the two factions were the between the evolutionary and the revolutionary socialists, if you will. The evolutionary socialists advocated uh, working through the electoral process and um, you know going that route to affect social change. And the revolutionaries advocated more radical and militant means. And what Harrison did is he tried to appeal to both factions of the party. Um, and he stressed to each that if you, you know, it's the importance of including, quote, Negroes. Negroes are central to your efforts. If you want to, you know, do better with the voting, you need Negro voters. If you want to do more militant labor actions, you need Negro workers. So he, uh, he that was part of his appeal early. I, I, Harrison writes, the first major theoretical pieces by a black socialist, a series of about five articles between 1911 and 1912 in the New York Call, which was a paper of the New York Socialist Party and um, International Socialist. I think that, is that the name? Yeah, I, get it. <laughs> I should remember this. Um, and uh, he, um, I'll come, I'll come. And he, he talks about the duty of the Socialist Party uh, he, to, he says, Harrison suggests to the SP that the take up the Negro problem at its upcoming 1912 convention because the time was right. He cited instances of racism within the party, including all these racist comments, the fact that the party had failed to address, had failed to uh, organize in the South effectively at all and wouldn't even root Debs down, down South. And he emphasized that the party has to address the question, Southernism or socialism, which? And uh, so he poses that before the 1912 convention. Uh, Harrison was actually, what he was doing was proposing a new litmus test for the Socialist Party. And this is in, um, let me find it. Yeah, here it is. This is in 1912. Harrison writes, and this is International Socialist Review, excuse me. He writes, the mission of the Socialist Party is to free the working class from exploitation and the duty of the party to champion the Negro's cause is clear as day. This is the crucial test of socialism's sincerity. And that was in uh, 1912. Now in 1913, a year later, Du Bois writes, the Negro problem then is the great test of the American social. So it was a year after Harrison. Harrison was really taking the lead in a lot of these issues. While he's in the Socialist Party, Harrison advocates for setting up a colored socialist club. He points out that the Socialist Party had uh, foreign language federations and women's clubs, uh, you know, organizations of women's clubs. And he thought there was a need and it wasn't even going to be exclusionary colored socialist clubs, but clubs that would deal with some of these issues faced by uh, black workers and, and common people, if you will. Um, Harrison is writing such things back in 1911 as if the overturning of the present class system should elevate a new class into power, a class to which the Negro belongs. This class will remove the economic reason for the degradation of the Negro. That is the promise of socialism. So he, he believed in socialism, he poured his heart out. So in a 1912 political campaign of, du, of uh, Debs, Hubert Harrison spoke as much as 23 times a week. He was a great public orator, he was considered unrivaled. 23 times a week, that's morning, noon and night, every seven days a week. Uh, he, uh, he, uh, a couple more things from this period. Uh, he, Harrison argued, and this is what attra originally attracted me to Harrison, because I was familiar with the work of 
Theodore W. Allen, and Allen had the same insights. And then I saw them in Harrison, and, and I kind of, I was writing originally on why no socialism in the U.S. way back. And I was going to go from the beginning 20th century and look at all the organizations, and I did. I had started that. But then I came across Harrison, and I dropped everything I was doing because here was this guy saying what, getting right to the essence of what I thought was important. And not many people had even heard of him. I had to get microfilm reels at the Schomburg Center and print them out and bring them home and read them. But Harrison challenged two main ideological props of white supremacy, as did Allen. The idea that racism is innate, because if racism is innate, you can't do anything about it. And the second one is key. The idea that white workers benefit from race prejudice. And Harrison argued, as did Allen, no. The, the racism is not in their interest. What's in their interest is solidarity with African American brothers and sisters. And you know, Al, Allen articulates very uh, clearly: so-called privileges are a poison bait. You know, you got to really come together. And um, Harrison writes: the uh, protected white workers don't gain from ra racism, uh, and because they can always be undermined. You know in struggles if they're betraying their interest. So Harrison also said some other things. Um, we're, getting, we're getting low on time, but I wanna mention one or two more. Um, okay, he points out, Harrison points out, it was in the interest of the capitalists of America to preserve the inferior economic, economic status of the colored race because they can always use it as a club. Race prejudice was a very useful tool to divide the workers. In The Black Man's Burden, in the International Socialist Review in April 1912, he writes a response to Rudyard Kipling's White Man's Burden, which is entitled The Black Man's Burden. And then very importantly, in um, 1912, he follows that up with an article in the International Socialist Review entitled Socialism in the Negro, in which he writes that the 10 million Negroes of America form a group that is more essentially proletarian and under slavery, under slavery, they were the most thoroughly exploited of the American proletarian. He's understanding, Harrison is understanding, slavery as capitalists and enslaved black laborers as proletarians. And this precedes Du Bois, a very insightful comment in 1935, uh, which people are picking up on today, but Harrison of course said it 20 odd years before. Du Bois writes, the South after the Civil War presented the greatest opportunity for a real national labor movement, which the nation ever saw, saw or is likely to see for many decades. Yet the labor movement with few exceptions never realized the situation. It never had the intelligence or knowledge as a whole to see it, this is, is underlined, to see in black slavery and reconstruction the kernel and meaning of the labor movement in the United States. So, um, and why is this important to understand black laborers as proletarians? Um, because if you understand black laborers as proletarians, um, you tear the covers off a lot of the betrayals of white labor, uh, of black labor, and you can really get more clearly at uh, the history you, you learn some of the main lessons of valiant struggle in the labor movement, in the labor movement, and you also can get at the how the white race quote was developed, which is what Allen's work is about a lot. So, and there are probably a few more quotes I would like to go to, uh, but um, yeah, if we exclude, if, yeah, that was that's oh one more thing, Asian immigration, Harrison at that 1912 convention when he proposes. To, to put the Negro question on the table. The Socialist Party didn't even discuss the Negro question, but they did discuss Asian immigration. And in their resolution on Asian immigration, they came out with, with one of the worst positions, I think, in the history of the Socialist Party, which concluded that race feeling is not so much a result of social as of biological evolution. It is deeper than any class feeling and will outlast the capitalist system. Class consciousness must be learned 
but race consciousness is inborn and, and cannot be wholly un unlearned. That is that race consciousness or is, you know, race prejudice, race consciousness is in, inborn, inbred. It's, uh, and again, if, it, if that's the case, what, you can't do very much about it. Um, and uh, uh, so uh, wrapping up on this, Harrison's experience, he poured his heart out, even in later years, he was willing to work with socialists and commun communists if they stepped up the game, so to speak, and people were met on equal terms, but he wasn't seeing it. And he thought that um, as long as conditions were what they were, he had a priority, as long as the white socialists and white, uh, and put white race first and class after, he had to concentrate his work in the African-American community. So there we go, sorry, got close to the end. Let me look at chat. That, that is fine. I, I, I haven't seen many uh, many questions. I do have one for you, and, and this has come up before. You know, we're we're living in the time where where Trump is proposing patriotic curriculums and changing our curriculum, and we do have folks in the party involved in school boards and and some of that planning. How do we get this sort of? I, we don't talk about the boys at all. We don't talk about so many folks. How do we get Harrison? And so many of these other folks who might not have been like the, the, the largest figures, but some of the most important involved, integrated into our education system more specifically in the in the high school level, I would say, or maybe earlier. Um, and, and and I guess the final question, maybe if you want to answer both and you can give us why is Harrison pushed aside, even in, in the Schomburg Center and other places? And what was it that he did or who did he get pissed? Who did we piss off? Um, because this sometimes happens with, with leaders or people who are very opinionated. Yes. Um, first, um, integrate more. Uh, I, I think, uh, first off, as I mentioned earlier, I think it's important for people to read Harrison, right? Your activists to read Harrison and get them into public libraries. The debate, debate continues to increase. I think there'll be much more discussion of Harrison when volume two comes out. Also, on my webpage, I have videos. If people go to my webpage and I, I have long ones with slides that, you know, I don't stumble and everything like that. They, they go fairly well. And you, you can take them, you can take portions of them. You can integrate some of what he's saying in your discussion. Now, um, but very importantly, and this comes from my years of work in the labor movement. What I got from Harrison and what I got from Alan is that Harrison is arguing on the centrality of the struggle against white supremacy, that in the context of this country with our history, this is key, this is central, this is what we have to take them on, this is what they rely on, the ruling class, and this is what we have to take them on on. So for instance, when I worked in the postal service, in the postal unions for 30 some odd years, I think we did very good work, particularly in the 70s and 80s, in which every issue we looked and we'd put out back then it was leaflets, but now you have the internet and everything. We put out weekly leaflets. Every issue we looked at, we looked at how is white supremacy affecting this and what are we going to do about it? How are we going to change it? How are we going to challenge it? And so for an organization like the Socialist Party, I, I would recommend considering that approach. Um, I oftentimes in some of my other talks, I would talk about how a lot of the left groups, you know, and I, I looked, I mean, your, your platform has many nice things, but I had to look for <laughs> where's that struggle against racism. And what Harrison and Allen are arguing is it's gotta be central because it's so key to how the ruling class maintain social control. There's not an issue you can look at in this country, I don't think, where it's not affecting it. So um, I think that would be important and you wanna, you wanna come at that and that would be one of the lessons that you wanna bring to your group and maybe citing Harrison, you know, as an example of somebody who's arguing that, you know, in some ways you can get little snippets, you can get bits from the videos, you can get quotes from the book. Um, there are other scholars and everybody writing about it. Now, why is Harrison not better known? Um, very briefly, I got this here too. I mean, although I know this stuff pretty much by heart. He is, um, right here. Okay. Harrison is poor. He's working class. 
He's black. He's foreign born. He's from the Caribbean. All these groups have under, been underrepresented historically. If he was a, a woman, <laughs> that would be included there. Um, also, I, I, I missed a session earlier, but Harrison, just on another note, he, you know, I, I know you had a, a gay and lesbian event earlier and trans and uh, Harrison writes and it's in volume two. He talks about going to gay dances in Harlem and having the time of his life. And uh, Richard Nugent in the uh, book Gay Rebel of the Harlem Renaissance comments very favorably about Harrison. Harrison was very open minded on lots of issues. But so the first issue is he's poor, working class, black, foreign born and Caribbean. Then Harrison is a radical on class, race and religion. We didn't get into this too much here, but it's covered very much in volume one. He's a free thinker. He breaks from the church. That's part of his uh, early development and how he moves towards socialism. He is, as you just hinted and suggested, Greg, he's a forthright critic. And he learned this in black working class intellectual circles in the early 1900s where people would come together, African-American, Afro-Caribbeans, they'd discuss and debate openly, but they'd be friends afterwards, but they had free flowing debate. They didn't bite their tongue and they grew in that way. And so he would put forth his ideas, but not everybody took it, you know, uh, the way uh, he put it forth. He had no long lasting organizational ties. Uh, although he was in the Socialist Party for a while and he was involved with some of his own organization, no long, he babbled around the Workers' Party and Communist Party in the 20s, no long lasting organization ties, no organization that kept his memory alive. That is often very important, like um, later on, Du Bois as the Communist Party keep his memory alive. Um, he dies young, Harrison dies young at 44, and but he doesn't, he's not martyred. Unlike, um, uh, unlike Du Bois, say, for instance, and uh, uh, he's not martyred like Malcolm and Martin. So uh, that's another factor. But one of the most important ones, which I've come to learn a great deal about, and I probably will write a lot more about after the book comes out, is how history is written in this country, probably every place, but how history is written, what gets passed on as common knowledge, what goes into the text, what goes into the college courses, who gets applauded for writing this and that. And, um, you know, so part of my task with this volume is to get, to reach out deep, deep roots about Hubert Harrison, Socialist Party. We're gonna hit the historically black colleges and universities. We're gonna be hitting the public libraries, the trade unions. Even when I spoke on him, I spoke several hundred times on him over the years and it will be trade unions sometimes. And uh, as I said, public libraries, uh, college libraries, um, you know, just uh, not your traditional place. Also, I went to the big name places, but uh, so, but that last one is very important, how history is written. And I can cite some very concrete examples, which I will do down the road. And maybe if you want, Greg, you can get that interview. <laughs> Well, awesome. Thank you so much, Jeff. And for the, the do folks- Do we have anybody still watching? I can't see We them. do, we do. And we and it's going to be rebroadcast. And I know you are, I, I could sit through your presentations as I have over the last few years. Um, I and, thought you pulled a Ruth Bader Ginsburg on me. <laughs> no. Yeah, I fell asleep. Well, that's, that didn't happen. I've been drinking coffee all day. Well, thank you. Thank you, everybody who's attended, uh, I'm gonna put links on how to get the books, the discount codes, but also I also encourage you to check out the, um, the Theodore Allen work on Invention of the White Race, which, which, which Jeff does introductions to and has done some incredible presentations. That's an eye opener. And, and specifically when we're talking about these issues, specifically to folks new to this, um, that's, that's uh, really important, I think. And, and Jeff has done a few presentations on that as well. Greg, um, just one thing, if I may. Yeah, sure. I have one video on Allen. It's over 160 some odd thousand. It was uh, on the invention of the white race down at the old Brecht Forum, two hours, but with slides. So you can stop it whenever you want. I think that one's very useful. But that article I mentioned on the top left of my webpage 
has the fullest treatment of the development of Allen's thought and it, it's meticulously footnoted. So it's a lot of the struggles of the 60s of my generation of SDS and the new left and been misconstrued by many subsequently, but you can get there, you can get the citations and the notes for the, uh, all the materials, but also I now have Allen's papers at UMass Amherst, which is where Du Bois's papers are. And we've started putting uh, uh, some of his papers online digitally. So I got Harrison Digital at Columbia and Allen Digital at UMass and UMass is starting to take my postal collection. So we, we, we gotta leave, we gotta leave <laughs> memories around. Well, I am honored to know you and have worked with you and will continue to work with you. I think you've been working on this the entire time I've known you, you we've talked about about, I did do uh, other things, though. I, I, I know I, you. I do. was a great soccer dad. I, 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 <laughs> That's um, I tried to be. My son didn't like soccer. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, everybody who attended. Thank you so much um, to Jeff for for coming out today. This is uh, being recorded and also streamed online on our organizing conference page. I am going to tighten it up, put some intros, put some links, and then put it on YouTube and our our main page. Uh, for the folks hanging around for the rest of the organizing conference, we have. One more webinar, we're gonna have an interview with uh, Green Party US and Socialist Party USA uh, presidential candidate, uh, Howie Hawkins at six o'clock. That should be great. And for everybody who's been on the other uh, webinars, we really appreciate your attendance. Thank you again, uh, Jeff, for taking out about an hour and a half of your time. Uh, I'm sure we will invite you again, specifically on Alan, before you get on the real big book circuit on the whatever the Oprah show or whoever you're going to be on next. <laughs> All right, everyone. Greg, I wanted to just thank yeah. you. You really do an important and wonderful work. I really mean that. So thank you. Thank and the you. flag stood up the whole time, so that's awesome. That that never happens. All right, everybody, have a great rest of uh, your afternoon and rest of your weekend. Jeff, thanks again. Sure. All right, folks.